The Charles River Museum's Mill Talk series is made possible by a grant from the Lowell Institute. And by the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. To follow us here on YouTube, click subscribe and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Good evening. My name is Kate Viens, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. It's my great pleasure to welcome Marianne Meyer to read and discuss her work, Kissing the Shuttle, A Lyric History. Marianne has written two other poetry collections, Telephone Man and Salt and Altitudes. Her work has appeared in numerous literary publications, including They Worked, We Write, honoring the lives of New England workers. Her poetry has been featured at the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, and her honors include Grub Street's Blue Period Poetry Prize, as well as Massachusetts Book Award and Pushcart Prize nominations. Marianne volunteers with the Ocean State Poets, promoting poetry in underserved communities. As a retired occupational therapist, she remains interested in creating environments that enable people to thrive, and in stories of resilience. Kissing the Shuttle brings to light such stories. The collection is centered in the Blackstone Valley of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, where Mary Ann grew up. Her poems interpret the lives of, of textile workers and the plantation slaves on whom the early cotton industry depended. As they explore the physical and emotional toll of tuberculosis, racism, scientific management and the promise of public health initiatives, the poems evoke emotions in the modern reader that echo those of our ancestors, from deep distress to relief and elation. For so many New Englanders, they recall our own family stories, whether our ancestors labored in mills along the Blackstone or on the Taunton, Charles, Merrimack, Nashua and other rivers. My own family history is rooted in the Blackstone Valley, centered on the Wunscott Mill on the north side of Providence, where my great-grandfather was a weaver and my grandmother, her sisters, and one of her brothers worked. I never met my great-aunt Dorothy, who was a sewer in the mill, but I've inherited her pearls and her cedar chest. I've sometimes wondered what hopes and dreams she attached to that necklace or that piece of furniture. Did she envision wearing the pearls on her wedding day? Did she imagine filling the cedar chest with lovingly embroidered baby clothes? We'll never know because she passed away in 1931 at the age of 22 of tuberculosis. I never met my great aunt Dorothy, but by reading Kissing the Shuttle, I feel as though I've come to know her a bit. And that is why it is my privilege to introduce to you, Mary Ann Meyer. Hello, I'm Mary Ann Meyer, and that um, really sends shivers up my spine, Kate, your, your introduction. I really appreciate your words. I honor the memory of your great aunt, Dorothy. Thank you for sharing that story. It also brings home that um, almost everyone knew someone who had tuberculosis in the early part of the 20th century. Um, we were a terrified nation, yet in my reading of the history and of many personal accounts, there was a remarkable light and positivity to the, to the time. Um, there was an energy and a unity, it felt, on the part of citizens to do what was needed to turn an epidemic around and, and raise the standard of health for all. Um, so I hope to share tonight through remarks um, on the book Kissing the Shuttle and um, the dire facts of an epidemic, 
um, as well as through, through the poems inspired by this period and a set of connected events. Um, I hope to share both that positivity as well as the, uh, the realistic dark days and of the, especially the turn of the 20th century, although it meanders in time. I was really inspired by the progress that we seemed capable of over 100 years ago, when, when at a time when, the, um, when medical science offered very little for treatment or cure, and science in general was very limited. Um, and I hope, I do believe that it's only natural and even relevant tonight to reflect on, on uh, the distinctions and parallels between then and now, that pandemic. It was called an epidemic, but I'm going to use the word pandemic and epidemic interchangeably um, with the, the TB epidemic and today's pan pandemic. And I hope you will reflect and um, draw your own insights and conclusions. In a time of epidemic, the human spirit prevails. And I would just like to keep returning to that theme um, throughout the evening. And to, to those of you in the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. I realize there's COVID fatigue afoot. And you are very courageous to be here uh, to hear about consumption galloping consumption, the great white plague, or the captain of all men of death, as Ralph Waldo Emerson put it, um, adding, because he, he suffered from tuberculosis, although he recovered, but he added that it felt like a mouse gnawing at my chest. TB has been with us since um, the beginning of humankind, and it is still is seen as a disease of the past, yet it is the number one infectious cause of death worldwide still. Uh, up to one billion, lives have, one billion lives have been lost in the last 200 years alone. Um, and something I just learned, which surprises me, uh, is, but I believe it, it's from the World Health Organization statistics, um, one quarter of the Earth's population carry the, the um, the bacillus, the bacteria that causes TB. Um, although the vast majority will never become um, ill, it is latent. New strains of tuberculosis make it elusive and very difficult to tra both track and treat. So it remains a huge challenge. May I spend a moment explaining the title, Kissing the Shuttle? I'm going to walk over to this beautiful replica of an original loom. I wanted to point out that sometime in the 19th century, somebody noticed that weavers in the, in the textile mills were dying at a higher rate than other cotton operatives and high, at a higher rate than, other, than the general population. And attention turned to this shuttle, the most commonly used sort. It's called a suction shuttle or a kissing shuttle. The title kissing the shuttle is not an expression of love for the loom, but rather it's a method of refilling a shuttle with a bobbin of thread, and placing one's lips over the shuttle's eye, sharply inhaling to pull the thread through. It was nicknamed the kiss of death, and we'll be returning to that. I'd also like to draw attention to the cover photo. Yeah. The, the girl in the cover who's gazing out the window, in fact, the title of the Lewis Hines photo taken in 1908 um, at a mill in North Carolina, the, the Rhodes Manufacturing Company in Lincolnton, North Carolina. The title is Spinner, A Moment's Glimpse of the Outside World. 
What is she thinking? Her name is Lala Blanton, L-A-L-A-R, Lala Blanton. I'm not suggesting she has any connection with tuberculosis, but she was a typical cotton operative, 10 years old, had worked in the mill for about a year at the time this was um, shot by Lewis Hines in 1908. She was probably through with her schooling and maybe working the allowable limit for children under 18 of 66 hours per week, or maybe not. In any case, we, we don't know, can only theorize why her name was not documented. She's an iconic figure, yet she's been unnamed for, she was unnamed for 105 years until a historian named Joe Manning in Massachusetts, I believe, still, began a search for her identity. Um, he began that search in 2009, and it took a few years to secure um, who she was with the help of a genealogist and historian named Maureen Taylor, as well as the granddaughter of Lala. Well, we now know more of her story, and I would like to return to her at the end of the presentation, so I hope you'll stay with me. I just, it's just one of the fascinating connections I found that led me to um, write poems that became this book. And I will say just about the book and a little bit about myself that I loved writing at the intersection of poetry and history. Both, I feel, are acts of finding. Um, I'm not a historian, but I have documentary and exploratory instincts, I confess. And I do think that um, poetry and history both respond to those urges. Um, I take poetic license throughout, and um, what I think of that as both an impressionistic and historical understanding of the facts. Anyway, my goal was to show the human face of industrialization against a backdrop of connected events, um, some not well known. And I, set out, I did set out to tell a local story, as Kate mentioned in her introduction. We share Blackstone Valley roots, Rhode Island roots. Um, I set out to tell a local story, but it seemed I got curiouser and curiouser, and the circles of inquiry just kept widening and came to encompass our broader um, and shared mill economy, and uh, New England mill economy. Um, the connections I found that were surprising fall into probably two themes mainly. Um, one is the nexus between mill life, mill labor, and health, particularly public health at the height of the tuberculosis epidemic. And this was a time when only social solutions um, mattered to outcomes. Um, and these social solutions were public health, public education. Um, we'll hear a lot more about that. Um, but suffice it to say that products and programs that are, we take for granted and are, are still with us today had their start in this era. Think Kleenex. Think disposable paper cups. Think hot school lunch program, pro programs in schools and formal outdoor recess. The second main theme and set of connections that, that intrigued me um, are the, uh, that along with the story of the dominion of, of textile mills um, is northern complicity in slavery to feed cotton fever, the world's craving for finished cloth or calico. We had the mill economy in New England, um, but slavery was the world economy. And I believe that so we're not finished, we're far from finished in finding the social solutions for that social disease and its aftermath, um, particularly with racism and persistent inequities. 
The term Lords of the Loom, Lords of the Lash, which is attributed to Charles Sumner, and I first read about in Stephen Dunwell's book, who's a local historian and photographer. He has given a mill talk, talk and it's wonderful. Um, his book has been my chief source for uh, historical research on the mills that I return to over and over again. This is when I first heard that term, Lords of the Loom and Lords of the Lash. So in a nutshell, that forms the second sort of um, um, nexus of the, of the book. While I'm speaking about um, giving credit, um, the book designer um, did a beautiful job and helped me to um, feel free to and made it happen that I could use so many archival photos um, to tell the story, which is really a nested story because the stories, the poems um, convey are only more deeply conveyed with the visuals. Um, so the book designer is Carl, Carl Peter Meyer, who's a fine, art, fine artist. He's a um, fine art silkscreen printer and also my husband. So I'm very um, pleased with the result, which actually feels like a collage effect and um, a little bit like going through grandma's attic, you know, um, and finding things in unexpected places. I did feel like I was weaving more than writing this collection. Um, my poetry influences that I will name are local to Massachusetts or have Massachusetts roots. And they're not only their influences for using poetry as a vehicle to reenact historical events, um, and also they form the um, part of the conscience of this of the collection. And the, the, these these people are Martha Collins, Faye George, and with Lowell connections, Michael Casey and Tom Sexton. And finally, all I'll say, because I, I always, the courage of concision always seems to evade me, so I'm, I'll wind down my remarks now, and we can get to the reading. Um, but the spark for, doing, for writing the poems that became the book um, was a photograph. This is a photograph that found me. Uh, I certainly did not start, start out to write a book or, not, or write a book about labor history. But I was clear, clearing out my parents' um, house after they died in, in quick succession. And um, feeling, I was reeling from losses and feeling um, like the geography of my childhood was slipping away even. So I'm clearing out their house, and I found uh, Images of America vo volume on P Pawtucket, an illustrated history of Pawtucket. Um, this is the Summit Street School, which is close to the Slater Mill. And it is the first, first of two um, open air or fresh air schools uh, opened in between 1907 and 1910, I believe, in Rhode Island. This photograph, and I had no idea what I was looking at, and when I found out what it was, and when I found out how close it was to where I had grown up, um, it really, I was really stunned, and I was completely drawn into the vortex. Um, it became the window through which I imagined writing a poem or two, and then that just kept on going as, as research will, <laughs> will cause, will cause the effect that research will have on one. Um, I will say that this is, again, the first, one of the first open air classrooms for children with, who were frail and had um, tuberculosis, um, however, in the early stages, they would have been they would have been quarantined at home, of course, with no remote um, learning possible, or in a sanator in a sanatorium, and no schooling possible. We will ta be talking more about this soon. Um, we'll give you much more of a sense, um, uh, uh, an experience of these classrooms. But again, I was very proud of um, hearing about Rhode Island's leadership in, um, 
in public health at a t in a time of epidemic and what we were capable of over 100 years ago. Let's begin at the beginning uh, when we were poised to become a mercantile society. In 1790, Alexander Hamilton wrote, who has seen a cotton plant? There is something of this material which adapts itself in a peculiar degree to the application of machines. The first poem is titled, Children Very Plenty. Mills rise on New England bedrock, on riverbanks, in steep-sided valleys, alongside falls and fast-moving streams. A good place for manufactories. Ideally, a toll road or waterway links factory to port. Ideally, a place very disagreeably suited. The inhabitants poor, their homes in decline, and children appearing very plenty, widows and children writes Obadiah Brown in 1797 to William Almy in Providence of the good place he'd found for their manufactory. You see, to mechanize spinning and weaving in the first cotton mills, the Rhode Island system of labor relied on family groups. And as Steve Dunwell puts it, the, it was a time when the farmer met the machine and the immigrant discovered America. By 1830, 55% of mill workers were children, as young as seven in the Rhode Island system. And I believe in the Lowell Waltham system, it was uh, as young as 12. Even 80 years later, by 1910, only 48% of children attended school. They were dexterous, they could crawl into tight spaces, and they earned almost as much as their um, mothers and fathers in the mill. In the Lowell Waltham system, which was a bit distinct from Rhode Island system, but that's, we won't go into that. There's a lot written about that. I'll just say that the ladies of Lowell, their needs may have been better met in some ways, but the work was just as harsh and dangerous. I'd like to Read the next poem titled, Mill Girl. Sun glinting off a wooden loom. The clanking of chains, the clack of the flying shuttle through the shed, the warp and weft, the in and out, the whir and throstle of looms and spinners from first to last slant light across the 15-hour day. The cleaning, combing, carding of cotton, the spinning of thread, the rustle of cloth. The mill girl, her tongue rolled tight against her upper lip to keep out sweat salt, cotton lint, a fleck in the corner of her mouth. Her neck is wet and aches as she arches, stretches her body across the wooden frame to weight the loom, to tension the threads. She strokes the warp, combed to a sheen, as if riding a horse, as if one with the beast, neck lengthening across an uncrossable field. Weavers, as I said, I think, had the highest TB rate of all cotton operatives. Of those in the mill for 10 years, half wouldn't survive. And Dr. Charles Chapin, health officer of Rhode Island for over 40 years, was the first to connect infectious disease with mill conditions and practices. He led the campaign for reforms. Though it had been known since the 1880s that germs caused disease and spread through contact, the idea of communic communicable disease just didn't fit with medical thinking. They had their own um, science skeptics, and they were the, um, the medical establishment at that time. Only in 1911, the suction or the kissing shuttle was banned in Massachusetts. Massachusetts mandated self-threading shuttles. Let's leave the mill and talk about open air classrooms and bring you inside. There's renewed interest today in the fresh air 
in outdoor consciousness, in the fresh air movement, in fresh air schools. <coughs> Public school practices we take for granted got their start here. Um, Ro Rhode Island doctors Ellen A. Stone and Mary S. Packard, inspired by the Waldschule or the, the German forest schools near Berlin, opened two of these fresh air schools between 1907 and 1910. Again, frail kids were given the opportunity for open air treatment and schooling as an alternative to quarantine at home. 20 to 30 percent of um, urban children were, to, uh, were tubercular, though many were advanced cases who couldn't attend these schools. But let's peek inside one. The Fresh Air School 1908, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Out of congested tenements they come, anemic, underweight, frail ones, tubercular in the early sapping stage before the lesions. Not to sanatorium, but to school. The first hot school lunch in the land, a schoolyard romp every 20 minutes, air as cure, air as elixir, for lungs unused to the appetite for it. For 20 children, once thought beyond aid or learning, the sense of belonging is as warm as the soup they sip this morning between art and first recess, schooled into a generous life, a happy picture. Golden rule, double rations of air, double rations of food, half rations of work, tall windows with muslin screens open wide, to autumn sleet, on a pot-bellied stove, mittens and bright paintings dry. Twenty pupils bundled up, sit inside their Eskimo bag, warm drawstring sack, little woolen helmet, a hot stone for their feet beneath each desk. They breathe their lessons in, and the world offers itself, spiral of scrubbed blue days, moving clouds and changing light, Sheets of rain swishing in on the wind. Roar of the falls, Slater's red mill, gust and whir of the water wheel, ever revolving, churning mist and rainbows. Explorers on the verge, learning wilderness skills at every turn. The last school poem, um, really speaking to what I, what I so enjoyed learning about these classrooms, was the outdoor conscious, consciousness. Uh, again, a resurgence today of interest today. The last poem is titled Jumping and Other Lessons. Science in the gathering clouds breaking open. Geometry in V formations overhead, flying south on steady wings. Geography in the river's map to the sea. Nature class in the sparrow's nest on the sill, loose cup of twigs woven with grass and web, lined with bits of wool and the egg sacs of jumping spiders. Music in the schoolyard chatter, lungs yielding to laughter, limbs unused to running, turning supple, elastic. Boys play tag, leapfrog and conquers, Horse chestnut on a string swung against another's, the one that doesn't break, crowned king. Thump, thump of double dutch. Girls run through swinging loops with fancy footwork. Faster, faster, Turner's chant, calling in each girl by name. Ellen, Dottie, Laura. All in together, girls. It's fine weather, girls. When is your birthday? Please jump in. Back in the mill. 1907, the first task of the Anti-TB League was to print and distribute um, positivity posters to every factory. This, I will, we don't have positivity posters, many of them at least to show you, so I will read what they were. And here is, of course, something that will give, gives you the flavor of the public health um, campaign 
common at the time, for my sake, don't spit, which led to anti-spitting laws throughout. And by the way, um, Massachusetts vigorously enforced anti-spitting laws in the first quarter of the year that it was, um, that that law was passed, I think there were 900 citations. The superintendent pins up positivity posters. Positivity poster beside the time clock. New scientific discovery. Germ spread disease. Gents, rid yourself of beard germs. Shave your whiskers. Ladies, raise your skirt hems out of the dirt. Let's defeat germs. Positivity poster in the lunchroom. Dirt and germs are the bosom friends of sickness. Let's show them the door. Positivity poster in the ladies' dormitory. The American Red Cross says, try Kleenex. Ladies, fold your, hand fold your handkerchiefs away. Kleenex is cleaner, tidier, your first defense. There was a democratic air to anti-TB campaigns. In the fiery symbols, in the product inventions, in anti-spitting laws, this was a social disease that begat social solutions. That's all that people had was one another. Um, citizens joined in like it was the war effort. There was but one enemy, and that was a disease. It was considered patriotic to join in efforts to stamp out TB. The Red Cross issued Christmas seals in the first Christmas seals in 1907. Europe had preceded by a few years. <clears throat> um, here's one. The caption reads, give me one, me sister's got it. The little boy is lining up, and the children would line up to buy their, their Christmas seals. There were exhibits at, at county fairs. Neighbors went door to door with educational pamphlets and to demonstrate hygienic methods. For example, um, the right way to sweep floors. Never, never a dry sweep, which would release bacteria-laden dust into the air, but always with a damp mop, for example. There was, uh, for a short, short period of time, the only museum then, then and still now that had a, the Museum of Natural History in New York that had a curatorial department dedicated to public health. It was a darkly hopeful time. The next poem is titled TB's Gifts. TB's Gifts. Shorter skirts, better razors, hot school lunch and formal recess, Kleenex, never ever wipe your nose on your sleeve, Christmas seals, positivity posters in the workplace, labor laws and shorter hours, anti-spitting laws, public health campaigns and Dixie cups, Borden's condensed milk, training for all in the proper way of brushing teeth, and for children, how to live as orphans in other people's houses. Yes, families were separated. It was not uncommon for a child or a number of children in a household to have to go to live with relatives if there was infection in the house. It was also not uncommon to be treated at a sanatorium and then go to live with a, a, a relative, a distant relative to stabilize. Next, some words and facts about TB, the climate cure, and the outdoor, more about the outdoor consciousness that it cultivated. Diseases do shape societies. And um, this, in this particular way, tuberculosis did. I'm going to make some, some remarks, and I hope, please bear with me. I, I just find the period very interesting, and we'll resume um, the poems shortly. Um, in 1868, it was discovered that TB was not heredita hereditary. In 1882, Robert Koch of the Koch Institute in Berlin 
um, isolated the bacterium that causes TB, and it is a mycobacterium named the tubercle bacillus. The, uh, airborne droplets in spittle, I think anti-spitting laws, spread the, back, spread the, the, um, the disease. The other cause was infected milk. Um, Rhode Island was among the first to mandate inspection and quarantining cattle uh, suspected of being infected. Um, at that time, at least in Providence, less than 60% of the milk supply was pasteurized. Uh, t the bacteria lives in dust and dirt for weeks on floors, skirt hems, and shoes, thus teaching one of the uh, methods was to teach people how to sweep and how not to sweep floors. P TB is not just pulmonary, it affects joints, um, glands, organs, and skin. It had been seen up until, and up until th even, hmm, up until the turn of the 20th century, it had been seen as hereditary due to a small heart or an ar having an artistic temperament. Um, this really fascinated me, a, a vestige of early 19th century and thinking and vic the Victorians and the romantic, romantic um, period, the romantic imagination was really drawn to consumptives or people with TB, then called consumption. Um, it was a perverse attachment. Um, consumptives held an allure and their company was desirable, making romanticism an indirect cause of spreading the disease. Um, to be a, quote, frail flower was um, an, an emaciated, pale, coughing, feverishly creative was fashionable. Um, and the, this, it was thought that a consumptive death befit genius. Uh, those stricken uh, reads like a who's who or a genius roll call. Um, Keats, Shelley, Goethe, Brontes, five generations of Emersons, uh, and Thoreau, Henry David. Um, he died at 45. The thinking then was he had caught a terrible cold um, and that caused his death. The thinking um, as the decades went on is that he would have died of TB uh, probably 15 years earlier, but his outdoor living extended his life. However, when the disease spread to immigrants of newly industrialized cities, there was no allure. Um, the thinking changed and people afflicted were shunned, um, outcast, feared, and there's a term called Phthisiophobia for that, because the other term for tuberculosis besides consumption was phthisis. I can't pronounce it. P H T H I S I S. Phthisiophobia. So the emphasis needed to be on prevention and control. There was no treatment, no cure, no vaccine. Um, it was all about social solutions and the new hygienics movement. The more who adopted a healthy lifestyle um, and practice hygiene, the fewer were shunned. Sanitation was not a concern of people at, in these days, at work, at home, um, the environmental sanitation. Um, so this was very novel. In comes the age of sanatoria, sanatorium treatment. This is considered rest taking the rest cure in the open air. The first sanatorium was um, opened in 1884 on Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks and called the Adirondack Cure Cottages. Edward Livingston Trudeau, the grandfather of Gary Trudeau of Doonesbury fame, opened the first sanatorium on Saranac Lake. He had tuberculosis, he was a doctor, after his medical school training, he, uh, had been, he, he had been treated using the rest cure for a prolonged period of time um, and opened the first sanatorium where he continued to do research into, the, uh, into open air treatment. The cornerstones of which are clean water, pure 
water, and air with a high ozone content, prevailing breeze, low humidity. Um, many health resorts followed and opened far flung um, in Arizona and Colorado, uh, usually at high altitudes. Um, but Henry, but I'm sorry, but Edward Livingston Trudeau, as well as a local man in Sharon, um, a, a physician named Vincent Bowditch, the son of Henry Ingersoll Bowditch, the, who was the president of the Massachusetts Medical Society, and by the way, had TB. His son, Vincent Bowditch, along with, with um, Trudeau, um, set out to show that the open air cure could be taken closer to metropolitan areas and, for, and available to people without means, the working poor, who couldn't travel. So in 1891, uh, the first in New England, the Sharon Sanatorium on, at Moose Hill um, opened, opened as an experiment for nine women, uh, $5 a week. And they um, then expanded fivefold over the next several decades, um, but primarily for women and children. In 1905, Wallam Lake, in the northwestern corner of Rhode Island in Boroughville opened. Um, Wallam is the, nip, nip, the Nipmuc um, word for, uh, is, comes from the Nipmuc word alum, meaning beautiful. And then shortly after, in 1898, the Rutland Sanatorium opened in Massachusetts. But the idea was to strengthen the body's defenses against the bacillus through diet, three squares a day, and a pint of milk every four hours. Strictly regulated rest and progressive exercise with medical supervision. The, the main goal was keeping the pulse down, avoiding fever, and never getting tired. The people who went to sanatoriums were termed sitters outer because that's what they did. Many improved, but they dealt with lifelong relapses. This state sanatorium on Wallam Lake, which we'll just call Wallam Lake Sanatorium, um, was also a self-sufficient 250-acre farm. It was a distant place, um, a half-day train trip from Pawtucket. It had its own train station, post office, printing shop, making Wallam postcards. And when it opened in 1905, TB was the leading cause of death worldwide. It was killing one in seven people in Europe and the Americas. Once the antibiotic streptomycin was widely used in the 1950s, outcomes improved. Although by 1940, cleaner water supplies and municipal sanitation and improved health care did, did help. We will follow a child now into the sand. Um, her name is Aggie. She is a composite of my ancestors uh, in Pawtucket. She is eight years old, spunky and industrious. Her father, Joseph, had succumbed to, to TB, leaving um, his wife, Ellen, Aggie's mom, with infant twins. And these poems take place after Aggie has left her mom to, to, to live at Wallam Lake. Noon Whistle. The men eat meat pies beneath the elms, smile and wave to Ellen walking by. One whispers she'll marry again with twins to feed. They miss Joseph and notice his widow's hemline rising as she climbs the hill to the fresh air school and her new job as girls' laboratory matron. Her husband, their friend, three months dead of consumption, then newborns, her eight-year-old Aggie, sweet kid, in the sand too, caught a cold that flew to her lungs, got infected caring for her daddy. The Mill families in Parrish will give what they can, send prayers her way and bingo money. When Joseph passed, the priest brought the news and still visits every week for comfort. 
He was helping Aggie prepare for her first communion. God willing, she's out by June. Occupational therapy. At first, Aggie draws scary stands of trees, scraggly pines on the edges of woods. She's warned, don't cry, never ask. When will I, who died, who'll make it out? 24 hour rest with bedpan, class one, bathroom privileges only, class two, can dangle legs five times a day, sit on the edge of the bed and swing them. Aggie weaves potholders on a finger loom, reads Clara Barton and Brothers Grimm classics, waits for the cart to be wheeled between rooms, accepts charcoal, crayons, white canvas. Consumptives must spend all day reclined, side by side in rooms or out on the veranda. Coloring, Aggie stays within the lines, careful not to cross over. So there were three levels of progressive exercise in the sanatoria. Class one, absolute bed rest. Class two, partial bed rest with bathroom privileges. Again, can sit up five times a day, do some handiwork, be on the porches. Uh, here they had a lace making industry. They can write letters and do some light hobbies. Level three is progressing gradually to eight active hours outside. Um, gardening, hobbies, more walking than sitting, work in the kitchen, etc. Class three privileges. Fever gone and lesion free, doing well without medicine to keep her pulse down. Aggie advances to class three, light occupation and walks on grounds. She's gathering strength, things are looking up. Come June, her grandmother will take her home in time to make her first communion. For now, she enjoys Sunday visits to the Henry, the milking shed, the plow horse in his field, the dank scent of the piggery when the wind blows just right. She likes things sealed in, so caps jelly jars with paraffin, puts things in place like pickled beans on the shelf, spools the clothesline out and in, straightens the pins, helps the milkman unload his wagon, taking care the bottles don't jiggle and unclot the cream solid on the top. Helps the cook for special celebrations, turn pineapple upside down cakes right side up. A secret about Aggie, she does well. She goes to live with her grandma and goes to school. Back inside the factory, the superintendent is still pinning up those positivity posters. Positivity poster above the time clock. Let's work together to fight the spread of TB. Practice hygiene. All washrooms now have new bars of soap and foot powder. In the weaving room, before another man is lost, before another child sickens, our factory will do its part and together we'll make a difference. Positivity poster on every bulletin board. TB is contagious. We will fight germs with enthusiasm. Remember, positivity is contagious. Be enthusiastic, stay positive. The book is in two parts, and part two, uh, the pace increases as autom automation and mechanization increase in the mills. Um, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who was, lived from 1856 to 1915, was the father of time motion studies. He was an American mechanical engineer and leader of the efficiency movement. He summarized his ideas in his 1911 book, The Principles of Scientific Management a pioneer in applying engineering principles to the factory floor. He helped create the field of industrial engineering. Workers hated the time motion study men and became increasingly discontent and alienated. This next poem is titled, The New Creed, Gospel of Industry. 
Replace the scythe and patient farming rhythms with the din of a thousand braid machines and spinning jennies. Mercantiles, metronomes, humans, motion systems. Make a system of them. Each one makes a greater sum. Automate that ancient human need to clothe and decorate. 1910, industrial discipline. This work demands a clock. Tick tock, time, cards, time, clock, time study men in lab coats with clipboards and stopwatches. Strict behavioral control for irresponsible, ignorant laborers. Labor multipliers, stretch outs, more machines assigned each worker, light up time, five o'clock in the evening signaling two hours more work, speed ups, machines cranked to the highest speed, labor paced for the first time in human history, maximum production per worker equals the highest degree of civilization. And that is a quote from Frederick Winslow Taylor, leader of the efficiency movement. Here is the landscape sur surrounding the mill. The, the poem is titled, The Mill Bell and the Clothesline. No one out of earshot or reach, no matter how bone tired, how deep asleep, in the dark, all wake, summoned by the bell that patterns the lives that swing between its call on Monday and the end of the Saturday shift to make the cloth, the calico. No one out of earshot or reach of its long, slow clang. Oh, calico, calico, calico. No matter how bone tired, how deep asleep, Inside the rain gray triple deckers all wake to the bell that echoes the country's craving for cloth. Hungry for calico, the latest patterns, the prettiest, the best from Pawtucket and Central Falls. All the three deckers built to last, house workers flooding in to a hungry country, its many tongued neighborhoods and old world smells meat pies heavily cloved to disguise what may have spoiled inside. Cook sweat clings to horsehair plaster walls. Chemistry of onion, cabbage, turnip fills stairwells, wafts onto tenement porches where clotheslines crisscross, sagging with shirts that never dry. The same blue shirts that cling damp to the backs of the laborers, a gray blue line reaching to dawn. The, the second part of the book also shifts southward. I see fine calico from northern looms and sweat-drenched calico head rags on the pickers in southern fields. The work, sinuous bodies, barefoot, back-breaking, Picking in dry fields, cotton in bloom, in baskets, babies on the ground, sung to. Remember Lords of the Loom and Lords of the Lash. First, I want to point out this image. This is the sheet music composed by John Philip Sousa, Sousa titled The King, Co King Cotton March. It was composed for the Cotton States and International Exposition in 1895 in Atlanta. And it was dedicated to the people of Georgia. The irony that, that, I, that is inescapable is that in the decades before the Civil War, millions of men, women, and children had been forcibly marched in coffles along slave trading routes in the greatest migration in human history. Lords of the loom, lords of the lash. The beatings, the cleaning of flax and cotton, the carding engine, boards with teeth moving in opposite directions. The pulling of cotton through teeth to comb it, 
grooming the fibers for spinning into yarn, stretching, twisting, spinning yarn into thread, wound onto spools, then unwound again to make the warp. The weaving of the cloth, the bringing together of warp and weft, the weaving, the unweaving, the unweaving. The Civil War threatens good slave-grown southern cotton and cotton fever, the hunger for calico and profit raging in the north, for king cotton and unholy union forms, planters and fleshmongers of the south, textile magnets of the north, mill owners, fleshmongers, the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash, the engine of freight and cash, feeding the country's insatiable need for printed cloth, printed money. Like a train, like hounds in pursuit, this mill machine and field army, once set in motion, will never be stopped or abolished, vow the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash. A preface to this poem is that the reference to ivory at, it, at the poem's end um, is uh, refers to the towns of Deep River and Ivoryton in Connecticut, which through 1954 were the largest importer of elephant tusks in the world. One African, one adult African elephant tusk properly milled could yield the wafer thin ivory veneers to cover the keys of 45 pianos. Heavy traffic, dark water circles ceaselessly Ships slip northward on amnesia, full of tobacco, cotton, denial, bound for enlightened providence, the mouth of the bay, the jaws of the cotton mill, the teeth of the carter and comber. Dark water circles ceaselessly. Ships turn south under the menace of storm clouds, filled with new bright cloth, spools of thread, dry goods, then call at Bristol, for silver, fine furniture, northern timber for ships, barrels of rum and bread from South County, and on to Connecticut's wharfs, groaning with ivory, tusks once carried by African slaves, now bleached and milled into hair combs, billiard balls, trinkets, objects de art, but most of all, in steamer trunks, piano keys, silent. Okay, one final poem, and I would, which returns us to the Blackstone River. Uh, so we're here on the Charles the Quinabaquin, or, or Meandering River, and back to the Blackstone River, or the Kittacuck, meaning Great Tidal River. In 18, mm, cotton factories lined its banks. It was the best harnessed river uh, with its system of canals and dams, maybe the best harnessed river in, in, the, in the US, um, powering the abundant mills, lining its 48 mile course from, the Quince, from Quinsigamon in the Worcester Hills into Narragansett Bay. It was also the most polluted in the US with respect to toxic sediments. The other natural feature of the river that made it such a, um, an abundant source of power for the mills was its steep vertical drop over, over its course. But in terms of pollution, waves of disease swept down its river and uh, actually Central Falls next to Pawtucket had the highest infant mortality rate in the country along with Fall River at the time. But the Blackstone was designated a National Heritage River in 1998 and a National Historical Park in 2014. Um, my last poem is titled Sunday Afternoon. Uh, the title and the last line reference Wallace Stevens' poem, Sunday Morning. Sunday Afternoon. Sunday strollers on the promenade. The factories closed, the river almost blue, almost river-like. The riverbank as it should be, elms not yet sickened, green thickness of willows. 
Mallards strut iridescent. Sun turtles shine in the muck. An eel glides luminous past boys fishing for pickerel in the shallows. Upstream children build rafts of sticks to watch them drift off, break apart on the lip of Pawtucket Falls. A father and son skipping stones, circles ripple one into the other as evening comes. Tomorrow, the violence again. The river goes crazy with color. The mills spew into the black stone. It's said you can tell what the mills are doing each day by the color of the river. Mustard, vermilion, lime green, magenta on Thursdays. Branding and burning the river. Heavy, heavy metals, dyes, varnishes, solvents, bleach, and a dark red poison to kill the cottonseed bug. A hot effluent slop raging seaward 48 miles from Quinsigamon to Seekonk. With all the waste that perverts this river, all the measures destined for her soul. Soul indeed, onward and upward. Um, I would like to say that my hope lies in revisiting our common history, the mistakes and lessons from the past with an open heart. Around here, we live side by side with the past. We have daily reminders of who we were. Can we learn from it, from the not so distant past? Can we gain a historical perspective? I, I would, I'm hopeful. I would like to close my presentation with uh, Lala Blanton. Lala, is, you are no longer nameless. We see you. There are many like you in the world. You're still somewhere where child labor is the norm in sweatshops worldwide. I look to you, Lala. You're not nameless. A historian, Joe Manning and Maureen Taylor, a genealogist, and your granddaughter, Myra Cook, tells a very, very long story, and we know your genealogy. Um, people can visit, uh, for the full story, visit uh, the website Mornings on Maple Street. This is the historian's website who, who unearthed Lala's identity. But Lala, if history is both nostalgic and prophetic, who are we? How would you see us today? Your own son just turned 100. How will your great, great, great grandchildren appraise us? What is the measure that they would take of our hearts and soul? What change can we hope for to better the world? Thank you for your attention. It is a privilege to be here. I really appreciate the invitation by the museum to give a mill talk. Thank you. Marianne, thank you very much for that evocative presentation. It strikes me that the Lords of the Lash and the stanzas in Kissing the Shuttle that describe the mill workers' lives are challenging to us to hear. Occupational therapy, the poem, evokes the innocent sphere of death. When will I? Who died? Yet in Fever Dream, another poem from the book that I highly recommend. We feel the sense of relief of Nurse B, who says, fever's broke. Aggie, it's a good morning. These stories that you found were not easy for you to experience, but they reveal the triumph of the human spirit. And we are in your debt for making this journey and recording it for us in your poetry. Thank you for being here, and thank you all for joining us this evening. <laughs>